So, um, welcome to my talk about um, Podman and containers, Podman containers and HPC. Um, I, my name is Adrian Reber. I work in Red Hat's kernel team since 2015. I'm mainly working on checkpoint restore and container life migration, but as I have been involved in HPC for probably the last 15 years, I'm also involved in, in OpenHPC. I'm kind of involved in the CentOS HPC SIG. And in OpenHPC, um, OpenHPC is a Linux Foundation project, and I'm, they, they have a technical steering committee and, and a board, and I'm um, working uh, with them together to make HPC easier um, for new users. <coughs> and 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 I just don't want to um, talk about Portman containers and HPC, but how the CentOS HPC SIG, what's the status of it, and how OpenHPC plays into it, and then how combined um, CentOS and OpenHPC, how you can use such an environment to run um, containers in an HPC-like um, scenario. So the first thing I want to do is um, give a sh short introduction about um, what HPC is, um, high performance computing is what it means, but the thing is it can mean a lot of things, a lot of different things to different people, but when looking at HPC, especially from an open HPC point of view, um, you, we usually talk about um, common setups like, like this, so you have a, normally it would be a, a compute cluster where you run um, simulations on it, and you usually have two kind of networks. You have the normal network, TCP, Ethernet based, which is used for um, maintaining the nodes, booting the nodes, depending on your provisioning structure, um, or distributing jobs from the login node where you submit a jobs as a, as a batch script, usually with some annotations to the resource manager. And then it's distributed um, to the actual nodes where it's running. Most of the time it's using the, the gigabit ethernet, the, the TCP networking. And once you actually simula your simulation actually starts running, it, it usually uses for communication um, during the simulation between the compute nodes, it uses a high-speed network, and the high-speed network usually has um, low latencies because you do not want to wait a long time from the results from one node to another so that you don't lose so much um, computation time. So this is a common setup you see, would see with um, an HPC side, but probably could be also something else. Um, but when talking about open HPC, this is usually what we mean um, with HPC. Um, this often you have a, um, a compute cluster which runs locally to you on premise, but um, there are also um, offerings from cloud providers where you can run HPC like workloads at one of the cloud providers, and they usually also give you um, some kind of high speed networks with low latencies. What what that is. You, I'm not sure what they use. Um, if you run it on site, you usually would use something like InfiniBand, or that's the most common, common at least, and um, what I have seen so far. Um, so now to the CentOS HPC SIG. It, it exists, but it's um, not very active, if active at all. Um, the CentOS HPC SIG was created in 2017, and when we first started discussion about the CentOS HPC SIG, the idea was to provide a set, set of packages um, which HPC users usually want to have on their system and which they are also expecting to have um, from previous or from previous HPC clusters they have been working with. And the idea in 2017 was um, to base the packages in the CentOS SIG on the packages provided by OpenHPC. I will go into more details a bit later what OpenHPC provides. And so what we did in the beginning, we took the OpenHPC packages, which were already released for uh, CentOS and, and SLES 12 at that time, CentOS 7, and rebuilt them in, in, the, in, the, in the CentOS build system. 
the result was pretty much the same what OpenHPC already provided. Um, the idea was to make it easier for CentOS users to get those packages on your system without needing to go to another project. But at that point, I basically um, stopped working on the HPC SIG because it, it didn't make sense for me to split a community between open HPC users and CentOS users and that's, uh, that's why I thought it, it's better open HPC already provides a community um, where a lot of people are working together to bring their experience how to run an HPC system together and which already have provided some um, uh, packages and documentation which user can use. So if, if I would have split the community between OpenHPC and the CentOS HPC SIG, it, it felt like the wrong, wrong, wrong thing to do at that time. And the advantage, at least from, for a user from the OpenHPC um, point of view, is that um, OpenHPC does not support only CentOS, but they also have packages built for SLAS. So it's, it's just a bigger community there, and it made sense, at least for me, to have it working there instead of splitting the community. So about OpenHPC, um, OpenHPC, um, having, having run an HPC cluster myself, I have seen many of the problems HPC users are trying to solve and, and need to solve. And so from my point of view, a project like OpenHPC really makes sense to um, because basically what everybody has to do is so you have a cluster and it has hundreds or thousands of nodes and you somehow have to provision all those nodes. You have to get an operating system there. And there are tools to do this um, for the normal non-HPC use case, but uh, the HPC community developed um, tools to get um, systems provisioned uh, a long time before and people are used to using those existing tools. So uh, HPC has provisioning tools um, which um, you can use and you usually um, do a stateful or a stateless provisioning depending on, on how, how you want to use your cluster, if you have disks or not. And once you have the system provisioned, you also need a resource manager because that's how you submit your batch jobs to the system. So every HPC site needs to figure out how to install a resource manager and how to configure it. And once that's done, you have to install software packages. And what's special in, in, in the HPC use case with the software packages is you want the same software packages usually in many versions installed on your system. So it's kind of what modularity um, tries to solve, but uh, the HPC community solved it many years ago. It, it's pretty much what like the software collections used to be or maybe they, they still are, but um, you install multiple compilers in multiple versions from different vendors and you want your users to use them all and based on those compilers you're installing <coughs> libraries which are compiled with those compilers and so it's a lot of software packages which you install and which are installed in parallel and one of the reasons why the users, the scientists who are running the simulations want to have so many different software packages is once they selected a certain set of software packages they never want to change their set of software packages because if the results of the simulation changes because the compiler was updated then nobody is really happy about it. So you won't have the same version for all the time and people running the systems want to update the software and people using it want to never update it. Um, and so this is something which basically every HPC site I have seen so far has to deal with and everybody comes with the same solutions up or similar solutions. And so OpenHPC is a, is a community where people came together to solve this um, problem in a community together and document it so that new people who have to figure this out don't have to start from the beginning. So about the, the project history of OpenHPC. OpenHPC was, um, so there are two conferences every year which are HPC related. It's IC, it's International Supercomputing, it's usually somewhere in Europe. 
And then there's SC Supercomputing, which is in North America, and the one is in June, the other one is in um, November, and this happens every year. And so at IC 2015, there was the first discussions about um, creating such, an, such a project where um, people get together and work together to provide a common set of um, packages and documentation, how to set up an HPC system and how to solve the common problems. Then in SC 2015, there was the first release, and since IC 2016, it's a Linux Foundation project um, where um, multiple um, companies and universities come together to work on OpenHPC. We are also doing workshops. There was a workshop at PERC, it's, it's a conference in North America, um, where there was a workshop to help users learn how to use OpenHPC from a system administrator point, but also from a user point. We did in October, we did a, um, uh, at Open Source Summit Europe, we did a also a workshop where we tried to um, help people understand how it works, um, the idea behind OpenHPC, and this is a list of the current project members, so it's a list, it's a, it's a community of, of different software and hardware companies, a lot of universities and um, a lot of big HPC users who have a lot of experience and they all come together and try to provide something which um, you as a new HPC user can, can easily use or even if you have done it a long time on your own you can uh, go there and um, work with us or use the software, use the documentation and try not to have a whole set of um, scripts or I don't know on your own. So this is a list, this is not, I don't know, it's maybe half a year old and um, we support CentOS 7 right now and Slash 12. We have x86, 64, and ARM 64. There are a lot of tools which help you run a cluster and set up a cluster. Then the provisioning tools I mentioned, there are two tools, OpenHPC supports or has in their documentation. It's Werewolf and XCAT. Then there are resource managers, Swarm and PBS Professional. That's basically where you submit your batch jobs and it distributes it to the compute nodes. Then runtimes is interesting, I will talk about this later in the container context because there, have, there are actually four or five different uh, container runtimes for the HPC use case and then there are um, parallel file system clients like Lustre and BGFS and then compilers and a lot of scientific libraries and MPI libraries and all of those tools are, a lot of them, if you, even if you include Apple, um, probably all already available, but not in a way HPC users would expect them to be, and, and that's what OpenHPC tries to solve. One of the key takeaways um, for me for, from OpenHPC is it's, it's a building block repository. It supports multiple operating systems and multiple architectures. Um, if you first look at it, it seems like it's a software repository with software packages common in HPC and the and, uh, important thing is, and why it's a building block repository, we, we don't try to force a certain set of packages on you. You can pick and choose which provisioning system and which um, uh, resource manager you want because there are multiple available. Um, which you can use, and you can also replace parts of OpenHPC with your own parts, so it's, it's, it really should be a, um, a pick-and-choose repository. You can take the source RPMs we provide, recompile them with the optimization um, for your CPU, so um, it's optimized best for your system. And what's interesting about OpenHPC is it's not just a software repository, it comes with um, detailed documentation, and this documentation tells you how, if you have a couple of bare metal systems and want to run an HPC system, it gives you detailed steps how to set up the cluster um, from, from bare metal to a full working system. And the good thing about the documentation, it's actually tested with each quarterly release because the documentation contains commands which you have to write down in your shell and they are all pulled out during testing and then run 
So each of the documentations we provide um, is tested for each release to actually work. And documentations are available for the combinations of architectures, operating systems, and provisioning systems, and uh, resource managers. So there are quite a lot of variants of documentations OpenHPC provides. And, and on the previous slide, I mentioned the parts, uh, the components which are part of OpenHPC. This was one of three. We are currently working on OpenHPC 2.0, and 2.0 will support CentOS 8 and Leap 15. That's that's the goal to have there. And um, once OpenHPC 2.0 is available, um, the 1.3 branch will put into maintenance mode. And for us, this means we will fix critical bugs, but we will not introduce anything new. We will update a few of the key components. We will switch to a new version of Slurm, GCC, OpenMPI, and we will also provide, um, if you have the ARM HPC compiler installed in your system, you can get binary packages based on this, but you have to have the compiler yourself. So that's it about OpenHPC and the CentOS SIG, and now to the containers part in HPC. So this is, is a long story, and it's, it's, it's a complicated story, and containers have been interesting for, for HPC users from the beginning, because what I told in the beginning, you want to have one set of packages, and it should never change, and a, a container would provide you this, and uh, the advantage of a container is if you start at a small HPC site with this simulation, at some point you see you need a lot more computational power, you can just take your container and go to another site, and it would just run there the same way it did on, on the other um, um, cluster. So they sound like they would provide a, a really good software encapsulation which you can easily take with you around. But the problem is when containers um, came up a few years ago, um, the, the clusters were still running rather <laughs> CentOS 5 or 6, so there's no namespaces support in there at all, and, and but people still wanted to have um, containers, and and if you then even went to CentOS or RHEL 7, then you could have installed Docker. But the problem is, Docker required um, root to run the daemon and for the users to connect to, and this was also um, a thing which not really many HPC sites um, were happy with, and so there were solutions like you would run VMs on your compute nodes, and then you could run Docker in the VM, but this was all not very um, easy to set up and easy to use, so uh, what happened in the end is actually that um, the HPC community created different container runtimes on their own. I th think there are at least four or five right now, and to work on, on, on CentOS 6 and, and all the distributions, what they basically did, they, they took a truth and had a binary, uh, and then the container runtime had a few set UID bits, uh, set UID binaries, which were then able to kind of do container things, which was not a container, at least how we see it today with namespaces. It, it was a solution, but um, all those, um, HPC container runtimes are very specific to HPC. One, one interesting point when looking at those uh, container runtimes, they were all rootless and they were all daemonless. And this is an interesting point when, uh, when talking about um, Podman, um, which I want to use later in a, in a short demo to, to run containers on an HPC-like system. And, and Two of the things how Podman is described is it's, it's rootless and it's daemonless. So you, can, you don't need any root rights to run a Podman container on your system, and you don't need any daemon running as root or something else on your system. So every user can just start a container without any, I don't know, configuration or preparation necessary from the system side, as long as the kernel is near enough. And, and interestingly, this, this, um, these features of Podman, I don't think they, they are related to, to what HPC needs, but in the end it was interesting that they provide the things HPC users actually need. And 
The design of Podman is also um, helpful when you want to run MPI jobs, because usually when you run an MPI job, you run the MPI command, and then the binary, the MPI, you run MPI run, you run MPI run into the command you want to run, and then MPI run spawns multi multiple processes on all the nodes you have um, requested from the resource manager. And what, what happens then is um, that the actual command is then, then running on, on the compute nodes. And so MPI run needs a container runtime that's uh, fork exec based because MPI run wants to fork and exec the processes. And if Portman also fork and access the processes, it will, it will just run the binary as if there is no Portman in between or if there is Portman in between. And this is now the point where I come to my demo. So this is, um, I have here on my, on my laptop, I have a <coughs> small cluster, one login node. This is where I'm currently logged in. And it's running Swarm, and I have two compute nodes. So you see uh, nodes two, that's the total number of nodes, and they are called compute one and compute two. I can show a few more details about the nodes. And you can see here, um, I think here somewhere it says four cores. So each of my Compute nodes has four cores. I have two of them. So what I can do, I can request um, a, a job, an interactive job to be run on the cluster. I just move it to the top. And I say, um, I want to run a, a job with eight cores. So I say S run minus N eight. And I want to run a bash so that it's interactive. So now I have been assigned um, to, a, to I have been logged into one of the nodes, and I have been assigned two nodes, and I have a script here prepared which does my demo so that I don't type anything wrong. <laughs> so the first thing I want to do, I want to um, so the s run command enables me on my cluster to um, to run commands on all of my allocated systems. And so now I'm telling s run I want to run on two nodes and two cores, and as I have two systems with four nodes each, this means I will run one command on each system. And I want to first uh, make sure that I pull down the, the container uh, before starting it, so that it's there. This actually doesn't, I did this before because this takes over the wireless too long, so the containers are already locally on my system, and now I'm gonna run just one container on my local system, it's just a Podman run, command without srun, so this is just like you would without any HPC context. So Podman will now run the UBI A container, and you see I'm running as non-root outside, and if I just start it like this, I will be running as root inside of the container. But if I want to run an MPI program in my container, I want to have the same user ID in the container than outside of the container, so I tell Podman, it should um, tell the user namespace to keep the user ID of my current users. So now I will run the same command again, and now it should, it should return 1000. So this is the user ID my current user has. And this was now without any HPC or anything. And now I'm running the same command with srun before, so I'm now I'm telling Slurm I want to run Podman run and the id command on two cores, on two nodes. And now we should see just twice the line, uid 1000s, and there it is. So those are the two um, containers that have been started. And um, because I've been talking about MPI the whole time, I want to run an MPI job, so I'm first gonna pull the MPI container, which I did before. And um, to show you how, how MPI run works a bit, I'm just now executing MPI run and host name. So what I should see is, because I have eight, core, eight cores on two systems, um, MPI run will spawn eight processes now. I should see four times compute one and four times compute two. And there it is. So this is now eight programs have been spawned by MPI run. This is now has been not an MPI application, so no MPI communication has happened so far. And now I'm, I'm okay, now I, I pulled the container before, now I just want to show um, the operating system of this container because if you run a container, you maybe want to run another operating system than what you have on the cluster, maybe newer 
um, versions installed in the container. Or, so this is a Fedora 30 container I'm, I prepared here. And now I'm going to finally run my MPI program in the container. So now I'm running MPI run and I'm telling MPI run to use two cores. And then I'm giving it the podman command. And this is still a pretty long command line and podman upstream is working on this to be able to put this all in a configuration file so that you don't have to mention it every time. So the, the important thing here for the HPC MPI use case is the, um, the parameter env host because this will copy in all environment variables from the host into the container. And this is needed because MPI run creates a lot of variables and temporary files which it uses to tell the processes it spawns how to communicate with each other. And so um, the process in the container, which is the last in the command line, it's home ring, um, needs to know the environment variables created by MPI run. And then I'm the next parameter I'm mounting uh, the Podman MPI run um, a directory from the host inside the container. This is also for MPI communication. This is the place where MPI run will create all the temporary files. And then I'm telling uh, Podman user NS keep ID. I want to run the same ID inside of the container than outside so that it can write to its files it creates in the temporary directory. And then I'm telling it to use the network namespace of the host. This is also necessary for MPI run because there's TCP communication going on between the hosts, uh, between the MPI processes. If they are in different uh, network namespaces, this wouldn't work. And then I'm telling MPI. Uh, Podman to use the PID and IPC namespace also of the host. This is for shared memory communication between the processes. And then finally I'm telling it use this container and run the uh, RIN binary in the container. And this should now spawn two Podman containers on probably the same host. I don't know, not sure how MPI run decides where to um, put the processes if I'm not using all resources, but I guess they are clever enough first to use local communication because that's faster than going from one node to another. So um, the MPI program has um, finished. It's, it's basically just initializing, sending an MPI message to the next part of the, uh, to the next MPI task which has been running and then it's finishing, and now I'm running the same command, but this time I want to use all the resources which have been allocated by the resource manager to me. And now we should see from zero to seven, this means eight containers will be created, um, eight processes, MPI processes will run, eight MPI processes in the container will talk to each other, either over shared memory locally, or over TCP because I don't have InfiniBand here. So um, and let it work. You see, they are not starting in in order. They are just finishing as they as they I don't know how they finished when whenever they started. And so this is my my first uh, demo I prepared for the for the MPI use case. And now I'm going away from my um, resource allocation. I have another demo which I like because it has a graphical user interface and it looks really nice, but <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a pretty useless demo. Yes? Uh, does it have a CV file system? Okay, if you have a parallel file system, for instance, you have to bind it? Yeah, yeah. I, um, so, just a second, I will uh, mention it again. So, um, because this is using X forwarding and you would probably never run an MPI job with, uh, with an X display because this makes all the performance you get from all those cores uh, for nothing and so, but for, for the demo, so I'm, I'm, I'm pulling down a container and uh, I have to do some magic to get X forwarding in the container and on the nodes. And this is now the, the command and, and you said, um, yeah, so, so you see I'm, I'm, I'm mounting um, the temp file system from the host into the container. And if you want to have another file system mounted into the container, you would do it just like this with the minus V flag to get the file system mounted in your container. So, and 
this takes some time um, for, for all the processes to start up and do the um, X forwarding and the communication. But this is basically, there's the, the game of life. It's a, I don't know, you've seen it before. It's a, it's a computer science applications where the, the state of one, oh, it didn't work. No space left on device. Okay, um, but it's really nice. Uh, Anyway, um, it's the same as before, just with, with an X display, so, um, and I really like it. So that's um, MPI run um, with Podman. Another interesting thing about Podman, which I wasn't really aware of before, is that none of the other container runtimes developed for the HPC use case do not offer the possibilities to, to do a, a rootless build of a container. So you cannot build a container on your HPC system if you're using one of the other um, container runtimes which, which exist for HPC. I'm told with, with a lot of um, um, configuring it might be possible, but with Podman coming with um, CentOS 8, it it's just works out of the box. You can just build a container locally, you don't need any special rights, and it supports the, the existing docker file syntax, it supports existing registries, and you can pull and push to existing container registries. And, um, and this is really interesting for, for HPC, it was really much more interesting for HPC users than, than, than I thought. And with this I'm already at the end of my talk. I will be giving a talk on container live migration and hosting in the container staff room, also based on Podman. And that's it, thanks. Questions? Yeah, um, how is the connection with MPI working? Because I remember with Singularity, we, we wrote that out, but only for single node jobs on our system. And there was documentation that you can do MPI when you insert the correct MPI libraries that match the cluster run <laughs> before uh, you run the container. Yeah, so, so you, you <laughs> that's, that's really the hard problem. Um, basically, what you need is um, you need to have the same MPI version outside of your program, outside of your container, than inside. So I'm lucky because I think Fedora 30 already uses Open MPI 4, or you can get lucky to use MPI run from Open MPI 3 to work with um, Open MPI 4. But this is really just just luck. Like you said, if you have a container, the best thing to do is you need the same MPI versions inside of the container as outside. And if you don't have this, you have to somehow get the container from your, uh, have, the, have to get the MPI um, version from your host into the container. And this is especially important if you're talking about uh, specialized MPIs for proprietary uh, interconnects which are not InfiniBand, which come from your vendor. So this is the same problem with Singularity and Podman. So you have somehow to get the right MPI into your container to be 100% sure you don't get any uh, errors. Uh, okay. uh, can you then uh, the NVIDIA drivers on the host? Or do you have to build the container with the NVIDIA drivers for the GPU on the host? Uh, I don't know. So... That's why you use the GPU. Yeah. So, if the GPU drivers from NVIDIA can be used from the host. So, um, I actually never have used any um, GPU acceleration, so I don't know. I know that Podman, independent of the HPC use case, there are hooks to get NVIDIA things into the container, but this is something I, I don't know. But you probably somehow have to... What, what I've done is, um, I've... For, for InfiniBand, um, I've, I've tried it on InfiniBand system, and what I basically did, I, I mounted uh, the, the dev InfiniBand directory into the container, and I expect for NVIDIA GPU access, you probably have somehow to get the NVIDIA device in the container. So um, the, the InfiniBand worked for me on the one test system I had access to, so... InfiniBand worked without having to install anything on the container? Any like any entity band that is on the container. You just mounted the device without installing any patch of entity like uh, the birds and you yeah, so, 
course. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I need it because if I prepare my container, I install one of the MPIs inside of it and it will pull in all the lib and, and work the and okay. whatever fabric. So the versions have to match as well, like uh, in the MPI? Yeah, yeah. Probably yes, yeah. Yeah, for what it's worth, we, we do, not with Pugman, but we do run container workloads on and that do stuff with GPUs and NVIDIA cards, and yes, you need the devices inside, you need the libraries to match between the host and the container. It's a bit of a mess, but it mostly works. Yeah, that's, as, that's, that's one of the main problems you have to solve with every container runtime in HPC. You have to have compatible libraries inside and outside. So, so the use case I showed of using another operating system is probably what many people want to use, but at some point they will just see that this will not work and probably they have to rebuild the container based on the operating system which is running on the cluster. Um, do you have a planned uh, release date for an HPC 2? <laughs> um, if we have a plan for the release date of OpenHPC 2, so what we are currently saying is the first quarter of um, 2020, so we currently have all packages built success. So the whole, GC, the whole GCC and MPI stack, we have built that successfully. Now we need to rebuild it all with the Intel compiler and the ARM compiler. So, uh, but we are, it, it looks pretty good so far. And, and I would say it's, it's possible this, this quarter, but I don't know, maybe it will, have to wait until I see 2020, which would be in June, so second quarter. So my recollection, and I may, may well be out of date on this, is that Docker containers can run on Singularity. Can, are pop, does Popman compile for the same form that can be run on, okay, be run so on Singularity? So your question is, Singularity can pull... Thanks. Singularity can pull down uh, containers from Docker registry and run them. That's my understanding. Yeah. Yeah, Podman does this. This is one of the things Podman always does. So you, there's only... There's only so actually, so my question really is, could, could we use Podman to build containers that we would then run under Singularity? Yes. And therefore ignore yeah. the user? If you, if you build a container with Podman, push it to a registry, and Singularity can fetch it from the registry, then, then it would work. I'm not sure there are two formats which, um, there, I think there's OCI.v1 and there's the Docker format. I'm not familiar with those formats, but I think Podman can handle both. I, I, that's what I would say. Another question there is? Yes, just, just a small one. Um, are there any SUID binaries involved? No, not at all. It's all. The question was if there are any SUID binaries involved. No, Podman is all namespaces. And, and the main thing is, is the user namespace. And actually the user namespace, I had to fix a bug in, in OpenMPI because OpenMPI um, does for, for local communication, they actually use ptrace to connect from one process to another. And this doesn't work over user namespace boundaries. Even if the user ID is the same, um, for the kernel, those are two different um, users, so um, there's this actually OpenMPI has to fall back to um, traditional shared memory communication to do this, but the, the user namespace is the one you need, and the user namespace is also the one which enables you to run it all without set UID binaries. Not being uh, able to do stuff as the road, I see there's a limitation, for example, you can use uh, capabilities or advanced scheduling which require root and in HPC are sometimes used. I don't know, row sockets and so on. Can, again, I didn't I mean, understand the beginning. Being uh, rootless, as yeah. you said, and uh, not having set up with this and so on, you can, for example, use capabilities or things like that. Is yeah, that's, right? that's, that's right, yes, yes. If you need special capabilities, you need root, but the, the, the goal I was looking here for is how you can run a container without root, without, if, if you need to do any, Thing additionally, then you have to do the same for the container, and maybe maybe then it gets even more complicated. I just, you're, uh, you're just bound by the, the limits of your users. So, for example, if you want to uh, oh, listen on port on a, on a privileged port like port 80, you can't do that. No, you cannot Without, do this. Uh, you have to run it as root. Yeah, yeah. I, well, there. So, if you just talk about Podman, I, I, 
and our privilege pods doesn't work because they in, in if you run outside of the user or outside of the HPC use case if you run rootless um, you still can run in your own network namespace but you cannot listen on privilege pods this doesn't work now yeah anything else no ah, another one, yes sorry if you're asking no. But there's something that's really interesting. Um, what is the default behavior? Uh, separating all namespaces and then you take the namespace you want to share with them also? So the default behavior is if you run Podman as root or rootless, I would say it uh, runs, it creates all the namespaces it needs. At least it creates the, the host namespace, PID namespace, IPC namespace, network namespace for root, not for rootless, I would say that's not possible, and then I probably forgot the username space. But if you want to run it in a, for for an MPI application, you basically have to disable them all so that the communication can work. Okay, thanks. <laughs>